Insightful podcasts by informative hosts. Insights into Things, a podcast network. Welcome to Insights into Entertainment, a podcast series taking a deeper look into entertainment and media. Your hosts, Joseph and Michelle Whalen, a husband and wife team of pop culture fanatics, are exploring all things from music and movies to television and fandom. Welcome to Insights into Entertainment. This is episode 134. Busting on Bob. I'm your host, Joseph Whalen, and my stylish and fashionable co-host, Michelle Whalen. Hi, everyone. How are you doing today, dear? I am well. How are you? I am doing well as well. So today is Thursday. We are past the midpoint of the week. Oh, thank God. Uh, <laughs> well on our way to a, a rapidly approaching weekend. Yay! Of Nothing. No, I got to rewire the media rack downstairs. Oh, yeah. Good luck to that. <laughs> that so, was supposed to be a, a Christmas uh, was, endeavor. <laughs> it's, a, it's a long, drawn out project. Yeah, well. Multi stage. Yeah, yeah. We'll get, you'll get to uh, it. Someday we'll get it. I got all the parts now. I think. I right. Think now good. now you have all the parts. I, so. well, I'm missing, on, missing two more parts, but they'll be here by the weekend. That's fine. Good luck uh, with that. But that's not what we're talking about today. Nope. Today on our Disney Detective. Disney CEO Bob Chappick has a new strategy for Disney, but the fans agree. And guests show distaste for Bob Chappick at Magic Kingdom with giant signage. I can only imagine. Mm. Because, you know, we all love Bob Chappick here. (laughs) We sure do. Almost as much as uh, Ryan Johnson. That's right. In our Tales from the Edge of the Galaxy, Disney, Lucasfilm, and First joined forces once again, plus Disney Plus's new Star Wars series, The Book of Boba Fett, hasn't caught on with the audience quite like The Mandalorian did. We have some statistics on that, which are very revealing. Mm -hmm. Then for our entertainment news, Britney Spears fans have a new purpose, freeing Nichelle Nichols from her conservatorship. And news from this year's Golden Globes that was odd. <laughs> just just odd. Yeah. And as always, we'll finish up with our insightful picks of the week and some afterthoughts before we get to all that exciting stuff. I do want to appeal to our listening and viewing audience to subscribe to the podcast. We are listed, our audio versions are listed as insights into entertainment Our video versions of all the network's podcasts are listed as Insights into Things. You can find us on Google, Apple, Spotify, Stitcher, Amazon, etc., etc. I would also invite you to contact us, give us your feedback, give us your pop culture shows and, uh, not tournaments, uh, conventions. (laughs) Tournaments, too, if you have. Yeah, if you have any tournaments, why not? You can email us at comments at insightsintothings.com. You can find us on Twitter at insights underscore things. We are on the Accursed Evil Facebook at <laughs> facebook.com slash insights into things podcast. Big fan, by the way. Yeah, I can tell. We are also on Instagram, only slightly less evil, at instagram.com slash insights into things. All part of meta. Or you can find links to all those and more on our official website at insightsintothings.com. Are we ready? Yes, we kind of are. All right. I love the confidence. (laughs) Here we go. Go for Disney Detective. So it seems that Walt Disney Company CEO Bob Chepik sent out a memo to Disney staff members on Monday that outlined three new strategic pillars for the company, according to The Hollywood Reporter. And the three pillars that he outlined were storytelling excellence, innovation, and relentless attention to the audience. What he said was, I believe our mission for this uh, year is clear. 
set the stage for our second century and ensure Disney's uh, ensure Disney's next 100 years are as successful as our first, he said. Right now, their behavior tells us and our industry that the way they want to experience entertainment is changing and changing fast thanks to technology and the pandemic. Chepik wrote, we must evolve with our audience, not work against them. And so we will put them in the center of every decision we make. Chepik also thanked employees who had worked from home offices, studios, or theme parks, and those working um, who had been working from the offices, the studios, and the theme parks, and those who were working from home while balancing childcare needs. Chepik added that long term goals to provide greater flexibility, suggesting that the company could adjust its in office plans in the future. But the reaction from most Disney fans uh, mission kind of left them a little skeptical. According to Inside the Magic, for example, some said that they were offended by the focus on the audience when Disney has obviously been increasing prices all over the place. Um, And this is something there have been a couple of different articles that have come out talking about the price increases. And we're not even talking about just the theme park tickets. People now are noticing that the food prices within the parks have gone up. Now, granted, you know, maybe in some cases it's only gone up 25 cents, but for other items it's gone up $2 or $3. So, uh, you know, a Chiro was already kind of pricey at $6 and now it's $7 for a churro Um, or a a bottle of soda uh, is almost like $6 for a little, you know, (laughs) <laughs> one serving where you could go and buy a two liter, you know, for the same price outside of the park. Um, so it'll be, you know, the intentions are great that he wants to put the guests first. But unfortunately, as we've been talking about for <laughs> a while now, I've, I've lost count of, you know, it, it seems like he's re- lost sight of the guest and the guest experience. I look at, I look at the three pillars. So we have storytelling, excellence, innovation, and relentless attention to the audience. And I think of that third pillar and I can't help but think of like a thief, a Mm, burglar. Yeah. And the first thing that they do is they case the place that they're going to (laughs) hit. They, they follow the victim. They, they learn the victim's pattern (laughs) so that they can, steal their money or steal their valuables mm. and make away with get away with it. Mm. And I can't help but think that, well, this is really what Chappick's talking about is relentless attention to the audience is let's figure out how we can take their money right. as pleasantly as possible and make them like us for it. Right. Because that's exactly what he's yeah. doing. Yeah. So and I can't help but 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 look at the you know picture that they put up on the website here and think, <laughs> wow, he looks remarkably like Kingpin. <laughs> I was going to say Lex Luthor. Or Lex Luthor. I mean, he looks like a villain. He looks like a right, superhero right. villain. Right, right. He doesn't, yeah, yeah. And and I think his actions speak volumes to support that. Yeah, yeah. That feeling, too. Anyway, let's stop busting on Bob and go to the next story to bust, bust on, on Bob. Bust on Bob. Yeah, so this was kind of funny. So uh, a guest showed some distaste for Bob at Magic Kingdom with uh, with a giant sign. So Walt, so while, blah, blah, blah. so let's try this again. <laughs> while Walt Disney World, Disneyland, and the international Disney parks are incredibly fun and immersive places to spend a vacation, this doesn't mean that the most magical place on earth is free from controversy. So as has been covered uh, by the Inside the Magic website, uh, and many other Disney guests have, you know, talked about how passionate and you know they are for uh you know uh things about the attraction and products and restaurants um you know that they just don't approve of and obviously most notably is the new Disney Genie and Genie Plus and the Lightning Lane services as many of the guests don't want to pay uh what it costs to use and to use these new services and they actually prefer the older ones better. So one of the most controversial things happening within Disney's company right now is 
obviously, Bob Chepik. Uh, he took the role of chief executive officer in February of 2020, right before the entire world shut down due to COVID. And obviously, many guests just don't approve of him uh, as they see him as a profit-driven, penny-pinching corporate guy rather than an imaginative and exciting visionary. While many blame Chepik for the problems Disney World and Disneyland are both facing, like the Galactic Star Cruiser and the closure of the NBA experience at Disney Springs, it is important to remember that a lot of these issues were already taking place or were developing while former Disney CEO Bob Iger was in charge. Chepik has even come out saying that he does not like being called a cost cutter and does not see himself as one. Regardless, many uh, Disney guests do not approve of him and his approach to the Disney parks. And that, as we've mentioned, they have been, you know, they have the petition to try and get rid of him. So now guests even notice a public display of disapproval at the Run Disney Marathon event that happened over this past weekend. In a tweet by Imagine Ears, a sign saying, you run Disney better than Chepik could be seen as runners were passing by down on Main Street. It's important to note that signage like this is actually prohibited at Walt Disney World and that the sign was most likely removed from a guest very quickly. Um, and, you know, but enough people got uh, pictures of it and then were posting it all over the place. And obviously another controversial event taking place is in the uh, in the Disney sphere. And this is uh, what we've, you know, been talking about is that the Galactic Star Cruiser that, you know, it's the hotel experience that's over $5,000 for just two nights. So we're getting close to the the launch of that. So that'll be uh, interesting to see how, how that happens. But it was kind of funny that at the marathon, um, you know, that the runners... <laughs> Could run Disney good, good for them. better. Good for you know what? Give them hell. Let that. That's, mm -hmm. that's the only way yeah. that you can make change. Absolutely. You know, you have to let Disney know that you're unsatisfied mm -hmm. with the direction that he's taken the company. Yeah, they're nose diving the company, and it's not even like they're they're taking it into uncharted territory. They're doing exactly what they did back in the nineties. Mm -hmm. And why after that? abject failure of a decade would they continue to want to go back down that path mm -hmm. they finally got to the point where people were coming back they were enjoying things they were making money hand over fist right and now they're going to go back down that route because you know lex they luther want wants to <laughs> wants to run the company into the ground that's a new name now <laughs> I mean, oh, it's just, Lex. it's a sin because you have so many people that were dedicated fans of the company that are now so turned off by it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. The, the other thing that's really disappointing is everyone and their brother is now busting on Chappic and Disney. And I don't have much ammunition to really even get into and get worked up over on the show anymore. Because you agree with everybody I, I do. now. It's like, okay, I got an army of people out there now that I've recruited that are going to do my bidding for so me. Instead of being, <laughs> <laughs> so instead of being part of DVC, now we're part of the... The, the anti-DVC. The anti-Bob That's right. VC or whatever. The we'll, busting Bob cartel or Yeah, something like ourselves. that. I'm sure we'll have a name soon. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll send that over to the marketing department. Let there you go. There you go. Uh, so that was all we had for our... Disney detective for this week. Mm -hmm. We'll be back in a minute with our tales from the edge of the galaxy. For over seven years, the Second Sith Empire has been the premier community guild in the online game Star Wars The Old Republic. With hundreds of friendly and helpful active members, a weekly schedule of nightly events, annual guild meet and greets, and an active community both on the web and on Discord. The Second Sith Empire is more than your typical gaming group. We're family. Join us on the Star Forge server for nightly events such as operations, flashpoints, world boss hunts, Star Wars trivia, Guild Lottery, and much more. Visit us on the web today at www.thesecondsithempire.com.
And yeah, let me push the button. I, I didn't push the button because I didn't flip the screen. And was, oh my goodness. I was too busy patting myself on my back for my script writing to do my job. <laughs> Sorry. <clears throat> Anyway, this week in our Tales from the Edge of the Galaxy, as soon as I find my mouse cursor here, mm-hmm. uh, I've got five, six screens here, so I, I lose it frequently. Uh, anyway, Tales from the Edge of the Galaxy, Disney, Lucasfilm, and First join forces once again. This comes from StarWars.com. For over three decades, First has been building a movement to introduce millions of young people to STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math, preparing them for the future, developing confidence, and inspiring them to be the leaders of tomorrow. And for more than 20 of those years, Disney has been a proud sponsor of FIRST, further providing today's youth with inspiration, access, and opportunity through STEM. This year, Disney and FIRST will continue to bring more hands-on learning opportunities and mentorship to youth, empowering them to not only think big, but to develop the skills needed to become the next generation of heroes and innovators and lifting them up as forces for good. Now, Disney, Lucasfilm, and First. Are you okay there? Yeah, I'm fine. Okay, you gave me a weird look. No, go. Okay. Uh, Now, Disney, Lucasfilm, and First are proud to announce Build the Future, powered by Star Wars Force for Change. Build the Future will give FIRST teams around the world an opportunity to amplify their unique stories as thinkers, innovators, and forces for good, and to demonstrate the use of their STEM skills, gracious professionalism, and global citizenship while off the field. Most impactful stories will be featured in an upcoming FIRST multimedia campaign together with Disney and Lucasfilm. We're thrilled to be a sh- to be shining a spotlight on first students and their stories through Build the Future, said Linwin Brennan, Executive Vice President and General Manager at Lucasfilm. Our future technologists, engineers, and change makers, today's students, hold the promise of enacting real change and creating a brighter future for all. Their creative brown their creative groundbreaking ideas will help our society confront increasingly complex challenges from health and hunger to climate and clean water. Chris Moore, the chief executive officer of FIRST, goes on to say, we're grateful to have innovative partners in Disney and Lucasfilm helping to grow our impact. Disney has provided our organization with invaluable financial and creative support for more than two decades. Their call for us to be forces of change combined with our deep commitment to the first core values, has inspired our community to build a better future through innovation and inclusion in their hometowns and around the world. With Build the Future, we look forward to sharing our students' incredible ideas and stories. As a first strategic partner, focused on reducing barriers to underrepresented, underserved youth, Disney and Lucasfilm, through the Star Wars Force for Change Philanthropic Initiative, provide financial support as well as mentorship and storytelling opportunities to inspire, strengthen, and diversify interest in science and technology careers. Their commitment to providing opportunity to more youth worldwide has expanded, with a new investment now reaching more regions than ever before including Japan, Chile, Turkey, South Africa, Germany, and more. In 2021, the funding provided by Disney, with funding provided by Disney, FIRST will be able to deliver STEM program access to more than 51,000 students in underserved and underrepresented communities. Now, this one kind of hits home for us Mm -hmm. because our daughter is a avid STEM student as mm-hmm. well. Yep. Now, I don't think her school uh, is part of any of the first programs at this point in time. Right. Yeah. I, I don't know. Yeah. But there's a number of, of different organizations out there mm-hmm. that support, you know, STEM education. Mm-hmm. And I think all of them are worthwhile mm-hmm. uh, because that's really where the future of our, our students are. You mm-hmm. know, it's, it's these programs that help to not only educate the kids, but to inspire them. Mm-hmm. And as much as I bash on Disney, um, I, I can't help but 
but compliment them on their support for mm-hmm. these things. Yeah, there's a if you go to the the website, there's a nice little video with a bunch of different Star Wars uh, actors basically talking about the program and saying, hey, you know, apply and, and, you know, send your ideas and you could be, you know, one that that's picked right. for this. So it was it was nice to, to see. And, and, you know, again, because our daughter is very much a steam kid. Well, and it's funny because yeah. one of the things that she did, had done uh, as part of a science and engineering project uh, previously was how to apply math in careers Mm -hmm. and you had to pick, I think, was it five careers or 10 careers or something like that? Something like that. And how you would apply math to it. And Mm -hmm. I thought that was really a great way to get kids to understand that you're not just sitting in class churning these numbers. These Mm -hmm. numbers mean something in the real world. Right. So let's figure out what they mean and what kind of career you can have. And one of the careers that she had picked to profile was Disney Imagineer. Yep. And we went through, and I think the example we used was a roller coaster Mm -hmm. and how you're going to use math to calculate the forces and the angles Mm -hmm. and the speeds and all that stuff. We also happened to be on vacation in Disney at the time, too. It it definitely did (laughs) So it kind of helped, yeah, yeah. Um, But, you know, it's things like that that Mm -hmm. that, it's the inspiration. It's not just the knowledge because if kids aren't into what they're doing and they don't want to learn, they're not going to learn. Mm Mm-hmm. They'll remember things because you're going to drill it into their head. But the spark of of inspiration has to be there for them to really want to learn. Yeah. And it's organizations like First and in their partnership with Disney to, to really do that. And they, mm-hmm. they do a very good job with that. Yeah. So next we have a story about my uh, insightful pick from last week. Mm-hmm. And it sounds like other people seem to share my opinion of it. So Disney's new Star Wars series, The Book of Boba Fett, hasn't caught on with audiences as quickly as The Mandalorian. This one comes from the Business Insider. Disney's latest Star Wars live-action series, The Book of Boba Fett, debuted on December 29th. In the nearly two weeks since then, it is yet to catch on with audiences the same way that Disney Plus's first live-action Star Wars series, The Mandalorian, did during the same time period. Parrot Analytics provided audience demand data for both series, showing that while they had similar pre-release demand, The Mandalorian significantly increased in popularity following its debut compared to The Book of Boba Fett. Now, audience demand accounts for the engagement with and interest in or overall popularity of a TV series. During their first 11 days of availability, Uh, The demand for Mandalorian was 75.5% higher than the Book of Boba Fett in the U.S., according to Parrot Analytics. Globally, the demand for the former was 101% higher than the latter. The Mandalorian, which premiered in November 2019, was the number one most in-demand show, both in the U.S. and globally during this time period. The Book of Boba Fett has been the 12th most in-demand show in the U.S. and 18th globally. Disney's developing a dozen new Star Wars shows for its streaming service, including Obi-Wan Kenobi, which its theatrical, while its theatrical movies have gone on hiatus. A planned Rogue Squadron movie from Wonder Woman director Patty Jenkins, which we talked about on mm-hmm. this show, was scheduled for release, release next year and has been delayed. It's a far cry from Disney's initial plan to move of a movie per year when it's first relaunched the franchise with Force Awakens in 2015. It's safe to say that the future of Star Wars is TV, and the definition of success for the franchise in its new streaming age could evolve. The Book of Boba Fett has enjoyed rapid success. Hasn't. The Book of Boba Fett hasn't enjoyed rapid success in the way the Mandalorian did, but demand for it is still in the top 0.2% of all shows, according to Parrot Analytics. And to think, I actually did a read-through of this earlier, too. Mm-hmm. I think I would have gotten this. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, tough day. Mm. The Mandalorian was helped by the Baby Yoda character, which grew into a viral sensation of which we partook. Mm-hmm. 
The Book of Boba Fett stars a fan-favorite character from the original Star Wars film trilogy, but that might not be appealing to newer casual fans of the franchise who subscribe to Disney+. Plus. The Mandalorian also had the benefit of being a launch title for Disney+, Plus and was its only blockbuster original series for more than a year. Reviews for The Book of Boba Fett have been solid. The show's first episode received 83% critic score on Rotten Tomatoes, and its second has a 100% score. The third episode actually debuts today. The Mandalorian has an average 93% critic score for its first two seasons, which is exceptionally high for a television show. On a macro level, it's not storytelling. It's not telling the most compelling story. But the show is packed with enough charming little details and moments that it's enjoyable to watch, the AV Club's review of The Book of Boba Fett said. And I think these numbers and that review kind of support my thoughts from last week. Mm -hmm. It's a show about a character that was endeared to a lot of people from the original series. Mm Mm-hmm. But the character had a very conclusive ending to his story. Right. And has been resurrected. And I think a lot of people were confused about why he was resurrected. Mm -hmm. I think part of the problem with the first two series is it's not telling a compelling story. Right. The first two episodes give you so much. I mean, it's 70% flashbacks. Right. And they're flashbacks that could have been told as part of the Mandalorian when he shows up in the Mandalorian. Part of the problem I think they ran into is they did so much foreshadowing in the Mandalorian because they introduced Boba Fett in the first season when you see him walking up the Fett right, sand. Right, right. But you don't know that it's him, but, but you, you don't know, know it's him. So right. they kind of hyped and hyped and hyped mm-hmm. and hyped. Right. And then in the last episode of the Mandalorian – you get a cutscene with him taking over Jabba's empire. And it, I mean, even for a diehard fan like me, it left me scratching my head. Right. Like, you're a bounty hunter. Why do you want to be a crime lord? You don't have an organization. You have one assassin friend of yours. You, you don't know how to manage. Like, like, being a crime lord is not, it's a, you know, I don't want to. You don't just it's, fall into it. it. It's a tough job. You know, you, you go to school for that. You know, you need a four a four year degree, you know, but it, it's, it's more complex than just waking up one day and decide that I'm going to be a crime. Lawyer. Right. You don't just go and take out the, you right. know, especially when you haven't been around. Exactly. In so long, you've been in, in the shadows. Now, I, I will say we have not the the third episode dropped yesterday. We have not watched it yet, but I've seen various people oh, that's right today's thursday not Wednesday. yeah um Ooh. various yeah various people with the hashtag not my boba fett yeah so a lot more people i think after this week's episode are like i had a couple people I'm, in my star wars guild watch it and kind of not give spoilers away but basically say it was it was the worst one yet okay so so and, and i think you know, uh, basically, like you said, and and what they they were talking about, I think with the Mandalorian, what it, the the biggest thing with that was, we didn't know who anybody was. Right. Everybody was a surprise, and then the end of the first episode, freaking Baby Yoda. Yep. And you know, and they admitted that they didn't want to release toys beforehand they they wanted to wait and you know and that was so smart of them and i think the problem with book of boba fett is everybody knows everybody but you see and i'll i would even go so far as to say even if mandalorian didn't have baby yoda Mm -hmm. it would have been as successful oh absolutely because right up until that point 
you introduced a brand new character. Mm-hmm. Nobody knew anything about it. Right. And everybody instantly fell in love right. with it. Right. It could have been a baby whatever. Right. It, the the package could have been. Well, and nobody was expecting it to be a baby because they, they right. tell you right off the bat that he's 50 years it's old. It's 50 years old. It could right. have been, you know, whatever. But the like that opening scene of the show. Right. Where it was the spaghetti western music. Mm-hmm. He walks into the cantina. The guy gets chopped in half. The guy gets and... chopped in half with it. I mean, like. It just it clicked on mm-hmm. all fronts, and right. you automatically have this this just rugged, badass looking guy who, mm-hmm. you know, it was that hand solo. Sorry about the mess. Throw a coin on the bar type thing. Right, right. And it was everything that you wanted. Mm-hmm. You know, right down until he teams up with the uh, the assassin droid, and he's he's on the e web, and he's blasting the door, and like everything right. clicked. Yeah. And then all of a sudden they just went over the top with Baby Yoda and, mm-hmm. and won over everyone else. Right, right. Um, so I think no matter what, it would have been successful without it because mm-hmm. it was a new character. You knew nothing about him. And now you're going to go on his journey and take that journey mm-hmm. with him. Right. Everyone that he met in that first season was somebody new that you never knew. You met them and, and they added to the story. Right, right. Boba doesn't need a series. Right. Boba never needed a series. And and the only thing I can think of is with all the flashbacks and whatever, that that's going to lead up to why he decided to be a crime boss. I I don't know. It just. If they, I'll tell you right now, if they want to save this season, okay, they need to have a flashback with him fighting Vader. Mm. That is the only way that you're going to you can even bring Luke Skywalker back for this and it's not going to cut it he needs to have a flashback of him fighting Vader and that gets him to some point to make him want to be a crime lord Okay, that's it Mm. if Vader doesn't show up this season is a failure okay so all right well anyway we'll have to watch and see I'm I'm glad to see that I'm not the only one Mm -hmm. who's questioning the motivations of the show yep That's it for our Tales from the Edge of the Galaxy. We'll be right back with our entertainment news of the week. Insights into Teens, a podcast series exploring the issues and challenges of today's youth. Talking to real teens about real teen problems. Explore issues from braces to puberty, social anxiety to financial responsibility. Each week, we talk about the topics concerning today's youth. We look at how the issues affect teens, how to cope with these issues, and how parents, friends, and loved ones can help teens handle these challenges. Check out our video episodes on youtube.com backslash insights into things. Catch our audio versions on podcast.insightsintoteens.com or on the web at insightsintothings.com. Go for entertainment news. So it seems that Britney Spears fans now have a new purpose freeing Nichelle Nichols from her conservatorship. Coming to us from BuzzFeedNews.com, the article talks about uh, how a bunch of protesters actually were out saying, we're going to do whatever we can to make sure that there's a lasting change uh, for not just Brittany, but for Nichelle and for everyone who is trapped in this corrupt system. Uh, The chants outside the downtown Los Angeles courthouse were familiar, but this time they weren't talking about Britney Spears. Free Nichelle Nichols. Isolation is abuse. Hey, hey, ho, ho. The conservatorship has got to go. So on Monday afternoon, a group of just about a dozen Free Britney supporters and fans of Nichelle Nichols, who became a Star Trek legend for her portrayal of Uhura, marched around Stanley Moss Courthouse to raise awareness about the 89-year-old actor's situation. Since 2018, Nichols has been living under what they believe is another abusive conservatorship that has allowed her son, Kyle Johnson, to take control of her life and finances and decide who she sees and where she lives. 
We're going to do whatever we can to shed light on the issue and to make sure that there's lasting change, not just for Brittany, but for Nichelle, but everyone else who's trapped, said the uh, Free Brittany LA organizer Kevin Wu, who spoke with BuzzFeed News. Known for her trailblazing role as Lieutenant Uhura in the original series the f- that first aired in the 1960s, Nichols is now living with dementia, a condition that has made her susceptible to exploitation. Johnson claimed in his original petition to place her under the court supervision, but her longtime friend Angelique Fawcett a producer and actor had argued that Nichols was able and is able to manage, manage her affairs with help from an assistant and that Johnson is not acting in her best interest. So instead, Fawcett says Johnson moved his mother out of her Woodland Hills home to New Mexico against her will, sold her property against her wishes and isolated her from her friends. She points to the troubling 2019 recording of Nichols screaming at Johnson to get his hands off of her and a disposition from a former conservator who raised concerns about him having control as proof that he is unfit to take care of his mother. You're trying to get rid of me, Nichols cries at her son in the recording. You just can't come and take somebody's home and money just like that. Hey, it's mine. Sorry, you're old. You're almost dead anyway, so I'm taking it, Fawcett had told BuzzFeed News. Look at all these amazing old people who are out there doing things. They're living the life till they last drop, and that's really what I'm fighting for, for Nichelle. So during a hearing on Monday, a Los Angeles County Court uh, judge overruled Fawcett's objections to Johnson's final accounting report from his mother's conservatorship, which is now under the jurisdiction of a New Mexico court, finding that she did not have standing to lodge her complaints that they did not pertain to a specific line item in the report. So the article goes on and and talks about the the different lawyers going back and forth. Um, and basically, at this point, it's it's kind of up in the air. Uh, they had a, a couple of different fans that showed up. Um, and the one person said, uh, you know, that being the, the fan who happens to be black and Latina said, you know, growing up, this was someone she could look up to, a powerful, you know, black woman in a powerful role on television. And that, you know, she just doesn't feel that, she's getting a a fair case that she's kind of being a slave, you know, in this situation and that, you know, people should, should take this to heart and, and care about it. So, well, you know, it's funny. This kind of, kind of took me by surprise because I didn't realize that she was under a conservatorship, Mm -hmm. nor do I really understand what the purpose of conservatorships are Mm -hmm. or the, the legal ramifications. Um, but it's, if it's if the allegations are true, it's unfortunate. Right. You know, she's a groundbreaking legend mm-hmm. in her industry and the things that she's done. And if she's really being treated the way that the allegations state that she is, mm-hmm. that's a shame and something needs to be done about it. Right. But I, I don't know. I mean, if she is right. living with dementia, how far gone, you know, right. is she at this point in time? And can she support herself? Exactly. And, you know. But I guess my point is, is. If anything, the system itself needs to be revised to the point that you have more qualified people making independent analysis mm-hmm. on an ongoing basis. Right. Making it making a, a ruling once and having it stand for decades probably isn't the best way for something like this. There has to be a review process. Right. I mean, hell, even people who are in jail get are up for parole periodically and get reviews. Right, right. You know, it's the least that you can do. Right, and that's the whole thing. You know, what what it kind of sounds like is with these conservatorships, until somebody fights against it, it's kind of like they're right. forever. You know, it, right. it, it almost... It sounds like that's really where the problem is with the Yeah, system, like it so. almost sounds like it's a power of attorney type Right, and I'm sure that, thing. that there is... There's a legitimate purpose to these. I mean, right, or else they at, wouldn't... Right. Have them. If you look at what was happening to Britney Spears mm-hmm. when she came on the conservatorship, I, I don't think there's very many people in the world that would say it probably saved her life. Right. So 
But it's one of those things that, okay, I'm young and stupid now. Right. In 10 years, maybe I'm maybe mature we, enough right. that we need to reevaluate. But, right. but is it every 10 years you evaluate? Is it every year? Like, th- there has to be something in there to, to, to protect people. Right. Anyway, let's talk about something even more odd than conservatorships, the Golden Globes. Yeah, so until Sunday night, <laughs> I had no idea that they were even going on. So live from Twitter and press release blasts, it's the 2022 Golden Globes. So with no live stream or cable broadcast, victory lapping celebs, cringeworthy host jokes, completely pointless performances, red carpet peacocking, or even press, the show, somewhat, still went on. (laughs) Um, So despite a scandal regarding its lack of diversity, the Hollywood Foreign Press Association went forth with announcing winners for the best in TV and film on Sunday, um, skewing the normal chaos for a toned-down live announcement, mainly since no network would air the spectacle. That means a very uh, small number of people who typically watch, last year's ratings were actually abysmal, were forced to simply imagine Ricky Gervais's smack-talking and A-list cleavage while spending yet another pandemic night in. Things may look a little different this year, read a very understated tweet from the official Golden Globes account uh, as its private affair at the Beverly's uh, Beverly Hilton in Los An- uh, in Beverly Hills, California began. So the film, The Power of the Dog and West Side Story scored top honors for the night, winning Best Most- Motion Picture and Drama and Musical or Comedy. Uh, Nicole Kimmin won for Being the Ricardos. Will Smith won for King Richard uh, for Best Actor and Best Actress. And this was Smith's first Golden Globe win, despite being nominated six times. In the drama category, uh, Rachel uh, Zegler uh, won for West Side Story and Andrew Garfield for Tick, Tick, Boom uh, in a musical or comedy categories. As for television, Hacks and its star Gene Smart were victorious with Best Television Series, Musical or Comedy, and Best Actress, with which marks her first Globe win. And Jason Sudeikis won for Ted Lasso for Best Actor. In the drama category for television, uh, Secession won Best Television Series, and its star Jeremy Strong scored the win for acting. And the Pose uh, actress uh, Michaelina J. Uh, Rodriguez made history as the first trans actress ever to win a Golden Globe, and it also marked her first win. Wow, that's, that's very interesting. <laughs> It's amazing how normally <sighs> when the Golden Globes are on, it's like a three-hour show, and it took me less than five minutes to to go through all of that. So really, it they could have just tweeted, you know, every well minute. And I'll, I'll be <laughs> I know you. You don't care. You. I I don't. I, I know. I couldn't muster enough care to even go I through know. and read that before the show. Good thing you didn't have to. Um, I, I kind of feel the same thing about all re- award shows. I know. You know, these these actors, I think they, they're pretty well compensated. Mm-hmm. They, they probably don't need any more glad handing or people patting them on the back at this point. And that's what it kind of makes you wonder now during all of this, what's the point of it? It's basically to make really rich people feel better about themselves. You know. And I'm sorry, but there's other thing. There's paint drying that needs to be watched that deserves more attention than these shows. Sure. Um, and we have grass that grows that that deserves to be watched more than these shows okay. do. So. Sure. And you know, it's probably you know toxic for me to say something like that on an entertainment entertainment podcast. podcast. But right. I'll be happy to watch the movies and review the movies. Mm-hmm. I just can't get into to award shows. Yeah. I really can't. Well, and I think part of the the award season is for those that, you know, oh, I didn't see that, but it got, you know, it won for the award. Maybe it's something worthwhile to So all to I need is a list. Right. 
You can have your award show, have your dinner, do all that stuff. And that's what they did. They don't, they, don't preempt my TV shows in order to do it. And time. they didn't this time. And that's what's perfect. Right. So I'm this perfectly was happy with this format. Right. So this was your perfect way of doing it. Yep. This is ideal. Okay. Keep it on Twitter or some other social network that I don't worry about. And that's perfect for me. Sure. And that's all we had for our entertainment news. Mm-hmm. I busted on the Golden Glows more than I busted on Disney today. That's pretty bad. Well, because you agreed with all the busting of Disney. So. That's true. Yeah. Anyway, we'll be right back with our insightful picks of the week. <laughs> Go for your insightful pick. So speaking of tick, that, tick, yes. boom, that was pretty good, right? I was like, no, it's over there. No, it's over there. <laughs> of uh, tick, tick, boom, this happens to be my insightful pick of the week. I actually had watched this uh, during the, the holiday um, break. It was something that popped up on Netflix, and I had heard about it, and I was like, hmm, okay. So on the brink of turning 30, a promising theater composer navigates love, friendship, and the pressure to create something great before time runs out. Based on the autobiographical musical by playwright Jonathan Larson, it's the story of aspiring composer in New York City who is worried he made the wrong career choice while navigating the pressures of love and friendship. So Tick, Tick, Boom is a 2021 American biographical musical drama directed by Lin-Manuel Miranda in his first directorial debut, written by Steve Levinson. Stephen Levinson, it is based on the stage musical by the same name by Jonathan, Jonathan Larson, a semi-autographical story about his writing a musical to enter the industry. So to give a little background of who Jonathan Larson is, um, anybody that's into theater would know uh, him. He is the writer and composer of Rent. And unfortunately, he passed away within hours of Rent opening up on Broadway. Um, And, uh, you know, he spent, you know, most of his life trying to to get a Broadway show, to get something. He wrote a couple of different things. And the idea behind Tick, Tick, Boom is he's trying to to get this one show produced and it, you know, they go through the workshops and then unfortunately it doesn't work, but the ideas that he kind of has for it are, you know, move on to the next show. And, and basically this becomes this and this becomes this. So you can see if it's something where you've ever watched Rent or, or saw Rent, you can see different pieces, you know, of his life that kind of became it. Um, and he, fe- you know, he kind of feels like, you know, if he doesn't have something by 30, he's never going to be successful. Um, and f- unfortunately, he didn't live much past 30, but he did become successful. It's very interesting. Um, and uh, Andrew um, Garfield. Garfield is spectacular in it um he he does the singing and and the dancing and and stuff like that would have never thought you know (laughs) spider-man you know did this and there's tons and tons of easter eggs uh throughout the movie you can actually you know go on youtube and and look for the easter eggs of all these different broadway uh stars um who who kind of you know lend their little um cameos to it uh one of the interesting cameos is one of the um characters is Stephen Sondheim and they have an actor playing him in it but at the end of the 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 movie Stephen calls and leaves a voicemail for Jonathan and this was when Stephen was still still living and he had talked to Lynn uh Lynn Manuel and he said, Oh, we're gonna do it, we're gonna do this voicemail thing or whatever. Would you like to do it? So it's actually Stephen Sondheim leaving the voicemail and he actually told Lynn Manuel Miranda, I wouldn't say it like this. This is it. and he rewrote the the script for it and did it and then, you know, unfortunately not much after that he had passed away, but he uh, saw a preview of the the movie and loved it and and everything. So it was kind of nice to have the blessing because uh, for Jonathan Larson, Stephen Sondheim was like his idol. He wanted to be 
like him. So it was very, uh, very nice to to have that intertwined in in the movie. So if you're a theater type of person, this would definitely be a movie that you'd uh, be interested in seeing. Okay, good pick. Thank you. So my pick this week, full disclosure, is one that I'm not finished with yet. I'm about 86% through, according to my Kindle. And that's Leviathan Falls, the ninth and final novel in the Expanse series by James S.A. Corey. The biggest science fiction series of the decade comes to an incredible conclusion in the ninth and final novel in this Hugo Award-winning Expanse series with Leviathan Falls. The Laconian Empire has fallen, setting the 1300 solar systems free from the rule of Winston Duarte. But the ancient enemy that killed the gate builders is awake, and the war against our universe has begun again. In the dead system of Adro, Elvia Kuye leads a desperate scientific mission to understand what the gate builders were and what destroyed them, even if it means compromising herself and her half-alien children who bear the weight of her investigation. Through the wide-flung systems of humanity, Colonel Eliana Tanaka hunts for Duarte's missing daughter and the shattered emperor himself. And on the Rosinante, James Holden and his crew struggle to build a future for humanity out of the shards and ruins of all that has come before. As nearly unimaginable forces prepare to annihilate all human life, Holden and a group of unlikely allies discover a last desperate chance to unite all of humanity with the promise of a vast galactic civilization free from wars, factions, lies, and secrets if they win. But the price of victory may be worse than the cost of defeat. So, the books, if you're a fan of, because I we, we profiled uh, the Expanse television series on here as well, so if you're a fan of that but haven't read the books, you're going to find there's deep similarities between the novels and the books, but they diverge at certain points. Uh, the current season of Expanse gets you up to about book five, I want to say, four or five, somewhere in there. This is book nine in the series. This is after a large uh, um, time gap. Um and it builds on the foundation of everything that came before it. And they do a very good job. I, I can't put this book down. I Every chance I get, I'm, I'm picking it up to finish this book because it's, it's such a well-written uh, novel. And the heartbreaking thing is it's the last one in the series. It's been such a great series. I've read all the other novels. Uh, and it's just probably one of the best written science fiction novel series I've seen in a very long time. And, and you know, looking on the screen here... Um, even George R. R. Martin writes, Interplanetary Adventure, the way it ought to be written. And nothing can really summarize it better than that. Mm -hmm. The character development, um, the storytelling, the, the reinforcement of foundational things that happened back in book one. And, and you don't have to go back and reread the books because they have these reoccurring themes and it's it's just it's such a well-supported book series on its own um that it's definitely worth a read um and and, and so far it's a fitting finale to the the nine book series leviathan falls available in hardback uh digital ebook pretty much anywhere you can get books now and that's it for my pick mm -hmm. we'll be right back with Stuff, but not the same stuff that we always do. Uh, so that's all we had today. Mm -hmm. uh, we were going to do afterthoughts, but we didn't have anything new, so I didn't want to uh, bother people with that. As we get closer, uh, our first show coming up is going to be in March. As we get closer to that, we'll talk about that a little bit sure. more and and. We'll have more added to the calendar. But before we do go, I would want to once again uh, invite folks to subscribe to the podcast. You can get audio versions of this podcast listed as Insights into Entertainment 
Video versions of all the network's podcasts can be listed, found listed as insights into things. Uh, we're available on Pandora, Castro, Stitcher, Podbean, any place you can get a, a podcast these days. I would also invite you to contact us, write in, get us on social media. You can get, you can get us on uh, email at comments at insights into things.com. On Twitter at twitter.com backslash insights in underscore things. We do stream on Twitch five days a week at twitch.tv slash insights into things. If you are an Amazon Prime subscriber, you do get a free monthly Twitch Prime subscription. We'd appreciate it if you threw that our way. You can find us on Facebook at facebook.com backslash insights into things podcast. You can find audio versions of this podcast on the web at podcast.insightsintoentertainment.com. You can find us on Instagram at instagram.com backslash insights into things. Video versions of the podcast can be found at podcast.insightsintothings.com. And for links to all of our various places where you can find us uh, and even some information about each one of the hosts. Uh, you can go to our official website on uh, www.insightsintothings.com. And that's it. Another one in the books. Have a good week, everyone. Bye. Bye.